mentioned how Gaussian integrals show up a lot in pr physical chemistry problems. And even if we know that the integral of a, uh, a, a Gaussian from zero to infinity, so half of the area underneath of a Gaussian, if I have a Gaussian curve, the area under the right half of that curve or the left half of that curve is this quantity we're calling I naught. Even if we know that, that's not enough to solve all the problems where these Gaussian integrals show up because another very common form that shows up is not the integral of a Gaussian, but the integral of a Gaussian multiplied by x to some power. So maybe x or x squared or x cubed in front of a Gaussian. So when there's x to the 0 or there's no uh, polynomial term in front of the Gaussian, we call that I naught. If we call it I sub n, if there's an x to the n in front of it, we can ask ourselves what are the, what's the value of these uh, additional forms of these Gaussian style integrals. So those, it turns out, once we have this one, are fairly easy to obtain by sort of normal calculus techniques. So let's first ask ourselves, what about this integral of I1? If we just stick an x in front of the Gaussian, and I guess I should say over here this I sub n is specifically for the area under that half of the curve, the positive values of x. So graphically, if I naught is the area under half of a Gaussian, this is the area under half of a curve that looks like x e to the minus x squared. So that graph still goes to 0 at large and small values of x, like a Gaussian does, but also goes to 0 at the origin because of the x. x is equal to 0 at the origin as well. So now we're asking, what is the area under this section of the curve? So that's the question we're asking. What is this I sub 1? This integral is actually relatively simple. Either by u substitution, noticing that x is the derivative of x squared, or related to the derivative of x squared, or uh, just by directly writing down, let's see, so I've got an alpha here. so. Integral of x e to the minus alpha x squared is minus 1 over 2 alpha e to the minus alpha x squared, which we can confirm if we take the derivative of this Gaussian, the derivative of the exponent is minus 2 alpha x. So the minus and the 2 and the alpha cancel, leaving behind just the x. So this is the integral of x e to the minus alpha x squared. We have to evaluate that from 0 to infinity, which gives us minus 1 over 2 alpha e to the minus infinity, which is 0, minus e to the 0. So that negative sign cancels this negative sign, and the result is just 1 over 2 alpha. So I sub 1 was not terribly difficult to calculate, much easier than I sub 0. If we do one additional one, it turns out to be a little bit different. The next one in the series is I2. So if I stick n equals 2 into this definition, I'm asking for the integral of x squared e to the minus alpha x squared. And now we're in at least a little bit of trouble because the x squared, we can't use u substitution to call the x squared the derivative or related to the derivative of the x squared. But we can use the other, maybe second most common calculus trick, one of the, the two you're likely to have retained from a calculus class, which is u substitute, uh, not u substitution, but uh, integration by parts. So if we say, I kind of wish the coefficient out front were an x rather than x squared, because that one is relatively easy to do. So if I say, let's let dv be equal to x e to the minus x alpha x squared, because I know how to take the derivative, or I'm sorry, the integral of that quantity. And what's left over is an extra factor of x. So the product of these two things, x times x times e to the minus alpha x squared dx is the integral we're interested in. Then du is dx. And if I integrate the one I know how to integrate, x e to the minus alpha x squared, that's exactly the same as it was above. That integral is minus 1 over 2 alpha times a Gaussian. Then those are the parts we need in order to do integration by parts. So this integral is going to be u times v 
minus the integral of v du. So I just need to insert the definitions I've chosen and choosing my u's and my dv's. And we find, so u times v, x times uh, minus 1 over 2 alpha and a Gaussian. So I've got minus 1 over 2 alpha x e to the minus alpha x squared evaluated between 0 and infinity. And then the minus integral of v du, v has a negative sign in it, so that minus becomes a plus. The 1 over 2 alpha I can keep outside the integral, but I want the integral of v times du, so that's the integral of a Gaussian, again from 0 to infinity. And now we can do both of these pieces. Regardless of whether I plug in an infinity, which dies, becomes 0 because of the Gaussian portion, e to the minus infinity squared is 0, or whether I plug in a 0, when x equals 0, the, the polynomial portion, the x, causes this thing to disappear. So this first term, both of the terms are 0, and that difference goes away entirely. For the second term, I have 1 over 2 alpha times the integral of a Gaussian from 0 to infinity, but we know a name for that. The integral of a Gaussian from 0 to infinity is exactly the, the I naught that we started with. So it turns out this I sub 2, the second, um, not the zeroth of the first, but the second one of these integrals uh, is related to the zeroth one, the basic one for a, a plain Gaussian, just multiplied by an extra factor of 1 over 2 alpha. So if we care about the numerical value, that's 1 over 2 alpha times this existing value. So now I have a 1 over 4. I still have a square root of pi on top. And I have alpha to the 3 halves on the bottom instead of 1 half. But the important thing to notice is that when we used integration by parts on I2, it reduced the problem down to I0. Likewise, if we run across one that looks like I sub 3 or I sub 4 or I sub 5, if we have I sub n, if we integrate by parts, it will relate it to the one that's too smaller. So now that we have an answer for I0 and I1, I2 is related to I0, I3 is related to I1, and so on. So if someone, for some reason, gives you I sub 17, an integral of x to the 17th times a Gaussian, you could repeatedly use integration by parts to work your way back down to one that we already know. Or if you go to an integral table, of course, you can find a, a closed form expression for these integrals that are obtained by a process like this. And because this integration by parts drops by 2 and we have different behavior for the odd integrals than we do for the even integrals, then it turns out we have two different answers for this integral. If n is an odd number, like i sub 1, then the answer we get is this collection of terms, um, 1 half, a factorial that hasn't uh, reared its head yet in the I1 term, but as we bootstrap our way down from I17 to 15 to 13 to tw 11 and so on, that's going to involve some factorials showing up, and then an, a number of powers of alpha in the denominator that is increasing as n gets larger and larger. So that's for uh, the odd n terms. And if n is even, on the other hand, then what we have is a different number of powers of 2. A different style of factorial. And here's the one where we have the square root of pi showing up over, again, some number of powers of alpha. So that's when n is even. And it's worth pointing out here that that's not a typo. I have intentionally written two exclamation points there. That is called a double factorial. If you've not run across one of those before, it's different than a normal factorial in that, for example, if I take five double factorial, that's not five times four times three times two times one. I have to skip terms. It's five times three times one, where I've skipped 
um, dropping by two instead of just by dropping by one. So the double factorial is different than a regular factorial, so keep that in mind. So uh, point here is to illustrate the technique of how to evaluate these Gaussian integrals in case you need to uh, run across one that you need to evaluate. But the answer that you can get by plugging into these closed form expressions that you can look up in an integral table uh, is, is, the, uh, is just as good if you don't want to do the work yourself. So there uh, is uh, what we have for, for Gaussian integrals. 